Okay, well, here we are again, and we're going to begin talking about Shakespeare's Hamlet today. But before we get into that, there was a question that one student in the class asked uh, when we were taking a break, which had to do with whether or not in the term paper you could use internet sources. My response to her was, yes, you can use internet sources as well as print sources, but you've got to be careful. And you have to be just as critical of internet sources as you are of print sources. There's a lot of, of garbage on the internet, just as there's a lot of garbage in print. And uh, we as intelligent, educated people have to learn to be critical. I don't mean in the negative sense, but have to learn to be critical in the sense of weighing and balancing whether or not what we are getting is really good information. So that's important. For example, um, oh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, teaching a graduate course in Beowulf. This is with a group of graduate students who were studying Beowulf in the original Old English. Um, and one of the, uh, the graduate students came in and was reporting to the rest of us that he had run into a website dealing with Beowulf and views of Beowulf that was run by an 11-year-old boy. <laughs> now, you can give all the credit in the world to that 11-year-old boy for the initiative he had in, in actually setting up a website devoted to Beowulf. But on the other hand, you know, what are you getting if you're looking at this from the point of view of a student or a scholar, right? So you have to be careful to find out what it is that you're getting. Uh, and if you just go in and do an internet search by typing in, say, the name of your author, uh, some of the stuff you get may be very, very good, and some of it may just be silly and trivial. And so just as with printed sources, we have to learn to make distinctions. And that's part of what becoming educated really means, is learning how to be critical, how to make judgments like this. OK, so uh, any other questions, by the way, since we're on the topic of the term paper? Anybody wants to raise now? All right. Well, let's go on with our discussion of Shakespeare and begin Ham with Hamlet. OK. Remember that I said, and this is on the syllabus, that you were going to have to view some film version of Hamlet. We have several different film versions here in the University of Houston Main Library, and you can check those out. You can rent a film of Hamlet. You know, all the video stores that I know of have usually several copies of several different versions of Hamlet. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about these in just a moment. And of course, Hamlet comes on television periodically, uh, you know, one version or another. And if you want to, you can always videotape it or find a friend who's videotaped it. Uh, you shouldn't have any difficulty, is what I'm saying in being able to fulfill this part of the assignment. And I'll tell you what that entails in just a moment. But I have put up here on the screen four different versions by giving you the directors of each of these. And I'm doing that for a particular purpose. Well, really two purposes. One is that if you've ever studied film, you know, if you've ever taken a film course, uh, films are usually referred to by their director's names. I mean, the title of the film, of course. But people will say, well, that's a John Ford film. OK? Uh, you know, or whoever the director may be. So in this case, I have referred to these different versions by the names of their directors. But in three of these cases, the directors were also actors playing the leading role of Hamlet. 
Laurence Olivier did what is arguably the classic film version of Hamlet. He did it in the 1940s, I believe it was 1948. Uh, did it in the 1940s. He did it in black and white. He didn't have to. You know, uh, even in the 1940s, they had, uh, they had technicolor and various other forms of color. As a matter of fact, earlier, he had done a famous version of Henry V in beautiful, beautiful color. So he could have done Hamlet in color had he wanted to. But he chose to do this in black and white because he could play with light and shadow and and illumination and darkness to artistic effect. And as the plot of the play gets darker and darker, Olivier plays more and more with the capabilities of, of darkness in black and white film. This is also, and we'll be talking about these different versions here in class a lot, this is also what is usually called the romantic version, the romantic version of Hamlet. Romantic not in the sense of hug, hug, kiss, kiss romantic, but uh, romantic in the sense of romantic literature. You know, the kind of thing that, that emerges at the end of the 18th century and then the beginning of the 19th century and is still with us in various forms. But the great romantics, uh, when we usually talk about the great romantics in our literature, are usually the, the poets and musicians and artists of the earlier part of the 19th century. So, uh, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. And also, this is generally referred to as a classic rendition of a Freudian interpretation of Hamlet. And I'll explain more what I mean by that and what critics generally mean by that as we go along. Then the second one that I've put up on the, on the screen is the version uh, directed by Franco Zeffirelli. And Franco Zeffirelli is a, an Italian director, as his name might suggest. And he made his career as a director of operas in Italy. And not surprisingly, I mean, if you've been to operas, you know what I'm talking about. Spectacle is everything. In, uh, well, it's not everything. The music, obviously, is, is the most important. But spectacle is always very important in opera. And Zeffirelli, of course, carries that out. I mean, he does wonderful things with settings and scenery and costuming and so forth. But he's also a brilliant director. Uh, he's also the guy who did that six-hour masterpiece entitled Jesus. I don't know if any of you have seen that or not. Uh, it's a, it's a six-hour miniseries that he did for television um, entitled Jesus, uh, which is just really, really, really wonderful. And controversial in certain respects, but no, nevertheless, a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful film. And then I'm including here Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein did a Hamlet in New York a few years ago. You probably know him as an actor who's played lots of comedy roles in particular in, in, in popular American movies of the 1980s and 1990s, though he's still around. And uh, at one point he decided to take on Hamlet, as many actors do. I mean, that is the pinnacle. I mean, if you can play Hamlet and be a great Hamlet, I mean, how much better can you get? Uh, it's an incredibly challenging role. OK, and at one point, he was uh, convinced that he should do a, a, a film version of that. And so what they did was they actually just set up cameras, and they filmed an actual stage production. So uh, this is done in a very minimalist way unlike Zeffirelli's. It's done in more or less modern dress, though it's hard to tell what modern means in this case, 
because the costuming is so minimalist, by which I mean that the women are dressed in very, very simple black floor-length gowns. Uh, very simple, you know, no jewelry or anything else to draw attention to, to their dress. Uh, and the men are wearing dark suits, uh, typically dark uh, navy-like uniforms. Uh, in fact, in some cases, they are naval uniforms. And because the play, as you know, is set in Denmark, these are Danish uniforms. But uh, they're very, very simple, as the dress uniforms for the American Navy are. And uh, nothing in particular to draw attention, again, to the way the men are dressed either. There's almost nothing on the stage. Once again, everything is kept to an absolute bare minimum. If you have to have a chair, a chair might be there. If you have to have a table, a table might be there. But there's no effort to provide setting in our usual sense of setting. And it's interesting that that forces us to focus really on the play itself and on the actors and the way they portray the different roles. And then I have put up here Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth Branagh has done that, uh, well, it's officially called a five-hour film, but there's a 30-minute intermission in the middle of it because not very many people can sit quietly through four and a half hours of, of a film version of a play. And in this one, unlike other versions of Hamlet, every single word is retained. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about is that the directors of different versions will make choices, not only about how the characters are going to act and about things like costuming and setting and so forth, but also what's going to be kept in the text. The Branagh version, which has every word of the play, as I said, lasts four and a half hours. The other versions are half that length or less than half that length. So obviously something has to have been cut. Lines have to have been cut. Whole speeches have to have been cut. In some cases, whole scenes have to be cut or drastically abbreviated. So that notice we're seeing really a different Hamlet in each case. Branagh sets Hamlet in the 19th century in what appears to be Scandinavia or something like Scandinavia, which of course is where the play is actually set. Um, but when you look at it, it really looks more like Russia, you know, 19th century Russia. But uh, there are parts of Russia that are very similar to parts of Scandinavia, so not to make too fine a point of that. And people are dressed up in 19th century costumes. In uh, Laurence Olivier's version, they're dressed up in Renaissance outfits, you know, that would have been contemporary with, uh, with Shakespeare and his audience. Zeffirelli has his actors dressed up in medieval outfits, in medieval outfits, even with guys with, you know, armor and, you know, medieval knights. Uh, why? Because the play, while it was written and produced in the, uh, in the, in the uh, early 17th century, it was based on a story which goes back hundreds of years into the Middle Ages. And there actually was a story, by the way, that developed in, uh, in Northern Europe about a person called Amleth, and which eventually spread, and Shakespeare apparently picked up some version of that story along the way. And of course, he greatly expanded it and turned the story, which is a pretty simple story, in its earlier versions into something incredibly complex. So going back to what I said earlier, you know, in, in our last class, 
that originality does not always consist in coming up with something that nobody has thought of before. Originality often consists of taking something that somebody has done before, but doing something way beyond what others have done with it. And Shakespeare did this all the time. Shakespeare's scholars tell us that there's only one of the plays which has an original plot. All of the others, including Hamlet, have plots that Shakespeare picked up from somewhere else. But what Shakespeare did with them is part of the proof of his genius. OK, so uh, Branagh, in his version, has people in 19th century dress, including military dress where that's appropriate. And the, the women are, you know, like Gertrude and Ophelia are in absolutely gorgeous gowns, uh, formal gowns, the kinds of gowns that you would wear to a ball uh, in most cases, though there are some exceptions to that, you know, like Ophelia's mad scene uh, is done as if she is in a, uh, a hospital for the mentally ill. And we'll talk more about that when we get to it. So what I have been saying so far is all leading up to the problem that I'm presenting you with. And that is that every film version you view, and there are more, I'm just talking about those four today. Every film version or stage version of Hamlet or any other play that you see is going to be an interpretation of the play First of all, on the part of the director, and then, of course, the director working with the other creative people, the costume designers, the set designers, if there's music, the, the musicians, uh, the cinematographer, who's obviously critical in all of this, and, of course, the actors. But notice it will be the director or the director working with a team of creative people who will have a vision of what this play is about. What is Hamlet about? What kind of a guy is Hamlet? What kind of a person is Ophelia? What is the relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia? What's the relationship between Hamlet and Gertrude, his mother? Different directors and casts will come up with different versions of answers to those questions and lots of other questions that we're going to be taking up in the next couple of classes. So what I want you to do is to view at least one film version of Hamlet. You can view more than one if you want to, and you'll really see what I'm talking about. But view at least one, and I want you to think about it as a director working with other creative people to create an interpretation of what otherwise is simply a text in a book. OK? So you go out and you get a text of Hamlet and read the text of Hamlet. But what's in the book is not Hamlet, right? A play is not a text in a book. That's just a script for a play. Those are the lines for the actors. But a production of a play is an interpretation of that text which attempts to realize that interpretation, to make real, in other words, that interpretation of the play on the stage or on film. So that's the problem I want you to be thinking about. And I want you to put yourself in the position of being the director of Hamlet. And I want you to be thinking, what would you do with a particular character, relationship, scene, and so forth? How would you handle it? What decisions would you be making 
about costuming. If you're going to have Hamlet done in modern dress, why? What's the point of doing Hamlet in modern dress? Rather than say, uh, you know, 16th, 17th century dress. You see the kinds of, of questions that I'm getting at? Uh, what about music? You know, are you going to use music? Are you going to uh, be using sound effects in certain ways? I mean, everybody talks about the visual effects in, in movies, but very few people really consider seriously the sound effects as well, right? Which can have an enormous impact on the way we experience the movie. Let me just give you one illustration how music can be used. Music can be used, as Olivier uses it, either to lighten the tone of the action at a certain point. There are parts of Hamlet that are very light, some of which are even quite funny. And there are other parts that are very somber and obviously very dark, because after all, this is ultimately a tragedy. And Olivier not only uses visual imagery to create those different tones, but also he uses music and sound effects to do so as well. OK. Um, <clears throat> what would you do? So what you're going to be doing, and this is going to be on the final examination, I'm telling you now, that this is going to be one of the questions on the final examination that you can count on, is I'm going to ask you to consider at least one version of Hamlet as an interpretation of the play, and then to offer your own ideas on how you would produce the play or some aspect of it. Now, obviously, you're not going to have time to talk about the entire play. But what you can do is you can focus on a particular scene. But notice, scenes don't exist in isolation, do they? How Hamlet behaves in the scene with Ophelia, where she has been put up to trying to test him. It's a trick by her father and the king, who are hiding behind a tapestry. And she's walking along. Hamlet comes up. And the interaction between the two of them is very interesting. Now, how that is portrayed is going to depend on how the director and the actors see that relationship. OK, we're going to talk about that scene in detail a little bit later on. And we can take other scenes as well. What about the scene with his, his mother, Gertrude? He's furious with her. In some versions of, of Hamlet, uh, like in the Olivier version of Hamlet, he's up on top of her, and he's just shaking her and so forth. And you know, talk about Freudian. You know, I mean, it's, it's bordering on the psychosexual. So that's a kind of interpretation that Olivier brings to the production of Hamlet. That's how he sees Hamlet. That's how he sees the relationship between Hamlet and his mother. And that's what makes sense out of how he has that particular scene presented. Also in the Olivier version, there's a point at which in, the, uh, in Act One, in which we're in a great hall. Here are the king and queen and the counselors and the people of the court and so forth. And Hamlet is sitting over in a corner, uh, dressed, of course, in his dark clothes because he's in mourning for his father, and uh, who has fairly recently died. And his mother, of course, has, has uh, remarried almost immediately. And the person whom she has married is 
Hamlet's father's brother. Uh, in other words, she's married her brother-in-law. And in those times, technically to marry your in-law was called incest. And that's what all the talk about incest is in the play. I mean, it's not incest the way you and I usually use the term in, in our time. We're talking now about hundreds of years ago where it was against the rules of the Christian churches to marry your in-law even after the death of the person's spouse. Uh, and if you did so, you were accused of being guilty of incest. Okay, so anyway, uh, Gertrude at one point comes down and uh, she kisses Hamlet. Well, no big deal. I mean, after all, a mother kissing her son. Well, 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 it's not quite that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had one student uh, a couple of years ago who had uh, rented that uh, version of, uh, of Hamlet, and she was watching it with her mother. And she said, I was really, really embarrassed, not by the scene so much as my mother, my mother actually saw that scene too. And uh, while she's sitting there with me, and that was really embarrassing. Well, because the way in which Gertrude comes over and starts kissing Hamlet, I mean, it looks like two lovers. Uh, well, again, this is Olivier's, I mean, it's not, this is not, by the way, totally gross or, or you know, enacted for very long. It's just a couple of seconds. But nevertheless, it's enough to kind of make you sit up in your chair for a second. Um, and then you look at other versions and you see how do they handle exactly the same scene. And different directors will handle that in very different ways. Now, I'm not trying to make some big deal just about that. I'm just focusing on that because it, it's a striking difference in Olivier's version from other versions of Hamlet. And you probably would not even have thought of having the scene played that way if you were simply reading the text of the play. OK, so what you're going to be doing then is you're going to be coming up with your interpretation of the play based on your reading it, your studying it, your viewing a film production. You will talk about a director's interpretation of a particular character, relationship, or scene. And then you will talk about how you would handle it. How you would handle it. Now remember, you can use your text when you're writing the final exam so that you can bring your text of Hamlet in. So, any questions about what I've just said? And we'll talk more about it as we go along. And I don't mean that my list here is exhaustive. I've given you four directors of four famous versions of Hamlet. But as I've said, there are more. And you, you know, if you run into another one and you would really prefer to do that, that's fine. It's perfectly fine. OK, let's go back to the screen. Let me talk just a little bit about Aristotle's poetics. Aristotle, the great philosopher of ancient Greeks, wrote a famous work, it's not very long, but a famous work entitled The Poetics, in which he gives his theory of drama. I mean, I know that you know, when you see poetics, you're probably thinking that it's a treatise on poetry, but it's a treatise on drama. But in ancient Greece, as in Elizabethan England, drama was, for the most part, poetic. Hamlet is poetry, right? Wait till you look at it. It's in what is called blank verse. That is to say, unrhymed iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter is a line that goes like this. Da-da, 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 da-da. 
okay? And you can scan the lines in Hamlet, generally speaking, according to that metrical pattern, but without end rhymes, generally speaking. Okay, Aristotle's poetics was rediscovered in the Renaissance and as a matter of fact became one of the great texts of the Renaissance as they were attempting to recover the glories of ancient dramatic art in Greece, classical Greece, Rome to some extent. Aristotle said, first of all, that plot is the soul of tragedy. Psyche is the Greek word, our word psyche. Psyche in Greek. Uh, so the plot is the psyche, the, the soul, the spirit of tragedy. Now what on earth does he mean by that? What he means is that you can have a plot which produces and let's just say here, broadly speaking, comedy or tragedy. Now a comic plot is going to present us with a predicament or a series of predicaments. But the characters in the comedy are going ultimately through goodwill, they are going to solve their problem or resolve the difficulty that they have had. I mean, think even of those silly little uh, uh, comic uh, plays that come on television around the dinner hour, for which the, uh, the average audience, the target audience, is, is 11-year-olds. I mean, I know a lot of adults watch those things, you know, the situation comedies. But uh, they're really aimed at kids, not little tiny kids, but, you know, kids, like middle school kids. And uh, what do you have? You've got a problem. It can be a problem in the family, it can be a problem at school, problem in the neighborhood. And then you have the, uh, the people who, of course, are people of goodwill. Eventually, in 25 minutes, not counting time out for commercials, resolving their problems. Okay? That is what is distinctive about comedy. Whatever problems people have, they are able, with good humor and goodwill and sincerity, they are able to resolve their problems. In tragedy, on the other hand, the opposite happens. Hamlet faces a problem, actually a series of problems, as do other tragic figures. And no matter how good the person is, or how hard the person works, or with what good will the person tries to resolve the problem, he can't or she can't. And ultimately the person is overwhelmed by forces that he or she cannot control. And that's what tragedy is all about. That sometimes there are things that even good people can't handle. That even good people get overwhelmed by. Okay, so as we shall see in Hamlet, but you can think of that in terms of other tragic plots as well. So plotting for Aristotle was really the key to everything else. That's why he says it is the soul of tragedy, but it's likewise the soul of comedy. He just happens to be talking about tragedy here. It is, if we can go back to the screen, <clears throat> what makes poetry more philosophical than history. That's a quote. He says that poetry is more philosophical than history. Well, let's take those terms apart. History for Aristotle in his time was simply the record of events in a chronological sequence. This happened, then that happened, then something else happened. Or at least that's the way Aristotle viewed it. Actually, that's not the way all ancient Greek historians behaved, but that's the way Aristotle saw history. Whereas 
poetry, and here he doesn't mean just poetry in our sense of poetry, he means imaginative literature generally. Imaginative literature is more philosophical than the simple relating of events in sequence because it demonstrates to us through its plotting the connections among events, the connections among people and the events in their lives. And these are essentially causal, causal connections. So that one thing is causally connected to something else. In a really good plot, which is what Aristotle calls an organic plot. And an organic plot is one in which everything is so connected that you cannot remove any part without disrupting the whole, nor could you rearrange the parts without disrupting the whole. And Aristotle likens the, the good plot then to an organism. I mean, think about any biological organism. Uh, and much of Aristotle's career, by the way, was spent studying biology, especially marine biology. And you look at organisms, and the different parts of the organism work together, right? I mean, you don't just have a stomach. You don't just have a heart. You don't just have lungs and so forth. Those different organs work in relation to one another, or they fail to work in relation to one another. That's how Aristotle saw a play, ideally at any rate. And so he calls that the organic pot or organic unity. He opposes that to what he calls an episodic plot, one which consists simply of episodes very loosely related to one another. This happened, then that happened, then something else happened, then something else again happened. Okay? And that's why poetry is more philosophical than history. It demonstrates for us, like philosophy, the inner connectedness of things. The plot of tragedy also arouses the emotions of pity and fear, he says. We feel pity for the tragic hero or heroine. And we fear for what is about to happen to them. So we vicariously, we vicariously experience the kinds of emotions that they may be experiencing as represented on the stage or on the screen. This leads to a catastrophe. Notice how many of these words are Greek words. The words we use for drama, how many are derived from Greek? This is why. It's largely through the influence of Aristotle's poetics. And that finally leads to a catharsis, a purging, a letting go of those emotions so that we get all worked up emotionally in the tragedy, but then finally there is a catharsis a catharsis of those emotions. Catharsis also is a term used metaphorically because a, uh, what, is, what is catharsis literally, or what is a cathartic? Yeah, you have an idea? I thought it was like a release of something. Yeah, yeah, it is release, yeah. Like a reversal? Yeah. Yeah, what else is a catharsis? I mean, what is a cathartic? You ever heard the term cathartic? It's an older term for a laxative. It's an older term for a laxative. Uh, and Aristotle, remember, is very interested in biology. And so he uses that term metaphorically. What we have is a kind of emotional catharsis here. Not a physical, but an emotional catharsis. Where our emotions may normally be all kind of blocked up. But going to the play becomes a therapeutic experience because we are able to deal with and confront those very emotions that we may otherwise find so painful, maybe even too painful to confront. And now, through the play, 
we experience a catharsis of those emotions so that when we come out, if you ever come out of a movie and just go, oh, it's like you're exhausted, right? Exhausted emotionally, not, not just physically, but you're exhausted emotionally by what the play has put you through. That's the kind of thing that Aristotle was talking about. And he says that's good for people. That's good for people. Not all the time, but at least some of the time. So then, see that's where, just to sum this up, tragedy and comedy can be distinguished. Both begin with a problem for which the characters seek a solution or resolution. In comedy, people of goodwill manage to control events and produce a happy solution or resolution to the problem. And we have that endless fantasy of people being in control of their lives. Wouldn't it be nice if we really, truly were in control of our lives? I mean, sometimes we may be in certain respects, but there are other times when we're not completely in control of our lives. There may be circumstances beyond our control that affect us. In tragedy, even a person of goodwill loses control over events and is drawn to a tragic catastrophe. And that's certainly true in the case of Hamlet. He's basically a good guy. And he's a very sympathetic guy. He's not perfect, but he's basically a, a good and decent person who loses control over events. And the more he tries to control events, ironically, the more that leads to his losing, finally, control over events. And that leads to his catastrophe. OK, so that this is basically just a, a, a restatement in another way of what I was saying a few minutes ago when I was distinguishing between a comic tr plot and a uh, tragic plot along more or less Aristotelian lines. OK, now, the theory developed at some point along the way in our history of drama that there could be such a thing as a tragic flaw. So you could have basically a good and honorable person who would have some weakness, some lack, or some obsession. And that would be the person's tragic flaw. This was an idea that developed especially in the 19th century. So that each one of us, I mean like you and me now, each one of us might well have some tragic flaw that might never ever come out. But in particular circumstances and actions of a particular plot, a flaw that might otherwise never cause a great problem in this plot might lead to tragedy. Okay. After all, none of us is perfect. And so the idea, in a way, is, is a very simple idea, that all of us may have some weakness. And that weakness may never cause us a problem. But what if we find ourselves in a set of circumstances where it is precisely that weakness that becomes our undoing? OK. Um, I don't know why this example popped into my head. but. Uh, say uh, somebody who panics when uh, 
Oh, say a child is choking. What do you do? I mean, you can panic and run around and scream, right? Or you can try to do something about it. Okay, and, and if you're the kind of person who can keep her head or his head uh, and, and know something about what to do, you know, the, the kid's going to be okay. But if you're the kind of person who just loses control in, in stressful situations completely, then, you know, maybe the kid won't be okay. So see what I'm getting at? That a particular set of circumstances may exploit a kind of weakness in one's character or personality that otherwise, no problem, you know. Okay. Uh, also, in Renaissance drama, there was something called the Machiavellian villain. The Machiavellian villain. Machiavelli wrote a book called The Prince. And he said, I'm not going to write a book like other people writing on politics and tell you about the ideal leader and the ideal state. I'm going to tell you what politics is really like. It's dirty stuff. And you have to be dirty to survive. So you can dispense with morality if you need to. The only values for Machiavelli are gaining power and then holding on to power by any means necessary. By any means necessary. So that if you have to kill somebody, you have to kill somebody. You know, if you have people who are opposing you, you have to crush them. You know, it's as simple as that. At the same time, one should seem to be virtuous in public. Just don't think that you have to be virtuous, says Machiavelli. This became a stock character on the Elizabethan stage. And this is the point at which we're going to pick up the discussion in our next segment.